Hi guys, welcome to another edition of The Big Shift, where we go into fascinating people and exceptional lives and really uncover what makes them exceptional on their journey. Today I have someone who's very, very current, a very inspirational guy doing inspirational things. But like all journeys, there's no light without darkness. It's with a great pleasure I have to introduce Marvin Herbert. How are you, Marvin? Absolutely phenomenal, I must say so myself, Steve, if I'm being brutally honest. I mean, I can remember back in the day as well, where I went to one of my mentors, right? You know, he was a pivotal mentor of mine, and I went in there, and I was I was fucked up in many ways. I still had all that anger. I had all that trauma of the past. I was still violent, the paranoia, all them feelings, all that stuff, right? And he said to me, Steve, you only need to change one thing. I said, what's that? He said, everything. And from that point, that was important to me. It takes time as a process, but I get what you're saying. And for me... I had to change absolutely everything. Uh, people, places and things from the inside out. That was my thing along this journey to where, to where I am today, you know? I'm still going through my now and I don't think it's ever going to stop. I don't, I'm, I'm growing every minute of every day. I still have issues with my relationships. I still have issues with my children. I still have issues with communicating to normal people. But I'm learning how to address them issues with the right mindset, the right frequency, and the right product. So I'm like a, a born again human being, and I'm learning how to do things in the correct manner. So I'm not beating myself up when I hit a hurdle or when I slip on a, a banana skin. You know, I'm not doing that because that'll just end me up back in prison. Like someone said to me the other day, what would you do if you see the geezer that shot you? I said, honestly, he said, yeah. I said, I'll ask him to draw a program with me to deliver him, because I deliver, I, I develop programs now to deliver in prisons and schools. So I said, I'll ask him to de develop a program on forgiveness, yeah, and help me deliver it across the country. That's what I would do if I met the geezer that shot me, do you know what I'm saying? Because for him doing what the biggest, baddest gangsters in London was never capable of doing, yeah, or never had the arsehole or the confidence or the courage because I was a lunatic, right? And this guy shot me because he had to shoot me. But it was the best thing that ever happened in my life, getting shot five times. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Because without that, I wouldn't have had to reflect on my life. I wouldn't have... That made me realise all the people in my life are not my friends because no one come to the hospital to see me. It broke my heart when they never come to the hospital. I thought, these bad. All my people going to come. I thought they'd come and look after me, give me hundreds of thousands of pounds to live for the next couple of years so I could walk. I never got a tenner. I never got a tenner. In yeah. fact, it was a fucking stranger that helped me out. And rest his soul, right? Rest his soul. The first person that ever helped me after I got shot was a man called Dave Campbell. And I'll give him his prop because he was. And then I went on to move into certain environments and do certain things with other organisations and other people. And then things grew up. Things blew up and things went like phenomenally out of control. I get exceptional people with exceptional journeys like you to interview on here because it's about the richness in there and the jewels. You know, I mean, for instance, you know, there is such a relevance between gang leaders, uh, career criminals, people at that level and CEOs, all these leadership skills. We want to go inside there to have a look at making things better, but what the exceptional parts are you know, and that less known content to give that to people so they can consider it so it will help them on their journey. Now, look, I have to ask, you know, I mean, you was nearly killed. We've been through a lot of that stuff. I've been through that, you know, I've been shot at and stuff like that. Never to the never to the level that you was. You shot five times, Marvin? Yeah. What was it actually like, them moments of knowing you're going to be shot like that and going through that. I know you went through immense pain in hospital. What was it like? A guy took a watch off a friend of mine, right? Uh, my driver. So someone was driving me about. We'd gone round my mate's house one day and my mate's asked, because I was a bit of a watch freak. I had all the top watches, right? So he's asked me if I wanted a couple of APs or a couple of protects. And I was like, no, I'm all right. I've got them. I've got them ones. I've got that one. I'm, like, I'm sweet. So then the driver said, can I have that one? Which was a... Uh, 
I think it was a Ferrari edition Panama. No more than £15,000 to buy in retail. So it wasn't that much of an expensive watch in consideration that the watches I normally bought was in the 50s and the hundreds of thousands of pound bracket, right? So when he said oh, 15 grand, I looked at me mate. My mate said, yeah, 15 quid. I said, and I think it wasn't 15 quid. It was retail at 15 quid. I think he had to pay three grand for the watch, right? So I said, yeah, I've, give, I've got him that Monday. I've got him that Tuesday. Not a problem. I've got, when I pay him his wages, he'll pay you. <clears throat> anyway. Me and this kid fell out over the space of the next couple of months, over a couple of little sneaky little moves he done. And I just sort of said to him, I don't want you around me no more. Get on with your life. Get on with it. So he's gone in his own direction. I've gone mine. A couple of months later, my mates rang me up and said, Marv, I'm not being funny. Any chance you could square that watch? I was like, what watch? I ain't got a watch off you. He said, no, no, no. Your pal, the driver, he took that watch, sat down. I was like, what? Ain't he paid you for that? The cheeky fuck. So I rung him up. I said, mate, what are you doing? I said, you need to go and pay for this fucking watch, mate. So he's gone, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you putting it on me for? I said, hold on. You took a watch out of my mate's ass, yeah, on the strength of me, yeah, paying for the watch. Now, you ain't paid for the watch, so I've got to pay for it. Now, if I've got to pay for it, I'm going to punch your fucking head in, mate. You're taking the piss. Now, I want you to go and give him the ready for the watch, or I'm coming to take it. He said, I think you're trying to bully me, mate. I was like, what? Are you having a laugh? So I jumped in my car. I said, where are you? I said, I'm down the pool. So I've turned up at the pool. He weren't there. His mate, Mark Carpell, was sitting there. I said, mate, where's your mate? He said, oh, he's going to get something. I said, yeah, he's going to get a tool, yeah? Sweet, not a problem. So I said, do you know what your mate's all about? I said, do you know what this is all about? He's gone, not really, no. So I've explained to him what it was all about. So he went to me, oh, do you know what, mate? Go home. Yeah, I'll bring him down... The gym, or I think I was in the gym in um, San Pedro Polygono. He said, I'll bring him down to Polygono tomorrow. You can sort it out. I said, No, fuck that. If he's going to get a tool, yeah, we can do with this now, mate. Not a problem. Me thinking, because I know the kid, I didn't think he'd have a gun. I thought he'd have a bat, a sword, a bit of gas, or something, right? So when he's turned up with a gun, he's like, he's lifting his finger. I said, I said What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? You fucking mug. So in my head, I'm thinking, I've got to get to him to get the gun off him. So I'm, I'm walking towards him to get the gun. He's pulled the gun out. And as he's pointing, I said, you better do what you're going to do, mate. And I've sort of gone towards him to get the gun. And he shot me in the leg. And I'll show you, I'll send you the x-ray. So it shattered my leg into hundreds of pieces. I just collapsed straight away. So then, obviously, I just said, do your fucking job, you mug. Because I didn't believe he'd have the arsehole to kill me. So I said, do your fucking job, you mug. And he's gone bang, bang. And I thought, oh, oh, he shot me three times. One went through my arm, off me, off, out, through my pelvis. One went down my willy, shot my right testicle into my pants. And I just, I never said a word after that, because if I'm being honest. You thought this is <laughs> it, right? After, after the third shot, it went through my willy, yeah, and blew yeah. my testicle into my pants. I thought, this cunt's going to kill me. And yeah. he went towards me, and I thought, ah, oh, we go. And then the instant thought was, my daughter's only two weeks old. Wow. He can't kill me. He can't kill me. And then he's gone, put a gun to my head, and he's gone, bang, bang. And that was it. I thought, I'm dead. I thought, I'm dead. I'm dead. Fuck. And I'm lying there, and I've heard, Marvin, is that you? Marvin, is that you? And I actually believed I was in heaven. I actually believed I'd gone over. Right? Because I've had a couple of experience prior to this. And I thought, wow, I can't believe it. I'm dead. And I'm going, what's happening? I've turned around like that, opened my eye. And I've seen my mate from the gym, and I was like, what the fuck? And I've looked around, and I was like, damn, and I've tried to move, ah! I couldn't move, my leg was fucked. So I said, mate, 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 get to my car and get my phone out of my car, quick. Because I'd read a few books, Andy McNabb and all that in prison, right? I actually believed I was gonna go into shock, right? Yeah. So I said to him, get the phone out of my car, quick, quick, quick. So he's got to find out my car. I rung a couple of people. I said, mate, silly bollocks. You fucking done me, mate. He shot me five times. I think I'm going to go over. Let mate, you know. Boom, 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 boom. Hello, mate. Yeah, look, I've been shot five times, mate. This fucking cunt's done me. I can't see. I can't. I'm gone. He's shot me in my head. I'm going to go. Please, just relax. Anyway, so then in my head, he's saying to me, relax, 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 relax. Breathe. Andy McNabb, I remember reading one of his books, and he said, you've got to breathe to get your heart rate down, which stops the... 
the blood flow, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Like, oh, the adrenaline, so, right? The adrenaline. Yeah, so I rung the missus to let her know where what's happened. She's not picking the phone up because she's in the shop next door to a scorting glaze looking for a new buggy for the baby. So I had to focus on my breathing, my breathing, my breathing. So I'm breathing, 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 breathing. And then the police turn up. No. And then I've rung an ambulance. Um, helicopter sanitarius. There's all private um, ambulances over there. So I've rung my helicopter sanitarius. They said, oh, what's the emergency? I said, I'm not being funny. I've just been shot. Pardon? I've just been shot. Where? I said, I don't know. I've just been shot five times. And they hung up. So I've rung back. I said, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I've been shot in Port Venus. I've been shot five times. They've hung up again. And then the police have turned up. And then the police have called the ambulance. The ambulance has come and took me to the hospital. I've gone in. I remember getting um, wheeled down the corridor. And I've gone to the, the, the doctor. I said, mate, like obviously in Spanish, I said, no matter what you do, save the leg. I don't care how much it costs, save the leg. So Let me ask you, you, look, you know, because I know Port Banus well, especially that strip down there. Right. You know, I go over there quite a lot. I've got friends over there. Where about some Port Banus to this happen? Do you remember Solis? Yeah. Right, outside Solis it was. Because he was sitting in Solis when I, when I met him, when I, when I went down there. Yeah, so he was sitting inside Solis and, like, I've come outside Solly's and it was on the pavement. Because when I'm sitting talking to that carpel, I've seen him walk across the road by the corner of the court in Glass. So I've jumped up and gone outside because I just wanted to have a straightener with a fella. I said, come well, on, then I'll be a silly bollocks. Yeah. And then I said, he's gone like that with a gun. I said, what are you going to do with that? And that's when he's gone, bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then basically I've said, save the leg, save the leg, save the leg. And then I'll, I'll send you the picture because the very next morning when I've woke up, Obviously, I've gone onto the operating table, blah, 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 blah. I woke up in the morning, I remember looking down at my toes, and I thought, as long as I can wiggle my toes, I'm going to be able to walk again. And I wiggled my toes, and I was happy. So I was like, yeah, we're good, we're good. Got on the phone, and then basically, I got a little bit paranoid that they were going to come up to the hospital and try and kill me after they realised I was shot. So then what I've done, I've told everybody that I had septicemia, and I think I'm going to go over. Because the first three days I had armed police outside the door, and then I've asked the police if they'd go, because I wanted all my friends to come over from England and come and see me. But people weren't going to come to the hospital, because I've, I've got a core circle of friends that actually come, but the people that I'd actually made money with and done that, I've actually risked my life. My, I was expecting 36 years in 2002 for a firm of people, and I got the not guilty by the grace of God and come out and went to Spain. But things I've actually done for people, risked my liberty, sat in prison, I mean, like, I actually thought they'd come and show some sort of solidarity. And it was that that broke my that had never come. So after the third day, the police have gone. I thought, what happens if these lot come? So I've got a couple of people around me. I had a couple of guns. So I made sure I had a gun in my bed all the time. And then basically, a couple of my mates come over. Everything was good. And then I put out there for the first two weeks that I had set to see me. And I was there's a good chance I'm going to die. And then when my pals got over and I had the gun in the room, then it was like, right, we're back to normal. I was back on the phone. Yeah, sweet. What's happening? Any of this, any of that? Crash bad wallet, crash bad wallet. And I just started making money again like nothing had happened. You know? And it weren't, like I said, it weren't until 2012 and 2015 I actually decided that crime, crime wasn't worth it. Look, thanks for that, Marvin. You know, and I would say, certainly... I mean, you know, that that's a miracle. You are a miracle. My femoral artery got punctured in three places. Wow. When, when the bone shattered, they, the bones come out of my leg and through the femoral artery, and I never even bled. That is they told against me all I'd medical never, walk again. understanding, man. They told me I'd never walk again unaided, right? Mm. Two and a half years to the day, yeah, two and a half years to the day, I had a professional boxing fight on a world title underdog. Yeah, I see that. Right? And I, I see won. some stuff on that. Oh, come on, man. How do you get to that? From that? Do you know what I mean? A world title undercard. D. Williams from Belfast. D. Williams from Belfast had his world title opportunity and I was the undercard on the night on a Sergio Martinez production in Spain. Unbelievable. And I won. And even when you watch the fight, it's on YouTube. Marvin's boxing match. Marvin with an S. Marvin's Boxing match on YouTube. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I must admit, I had a little look at that because, you know, it's a very, very inspiring story and I get it all the way through. And that is, um, that's a real testament 
to your spirit, certainly, and the human spirit. Now, look, we're going we're gonna to go into some of the real inspirational things that you've gone on to do. Before we do that, I want you to just, you know, uh, give us a bit of detail, because there was another really, really dark period in your life where you was arrested. You know, you know they were saying you was a hitman, uh, an enforcer. You know, you was caught with a list of all these names. A lot of them, you know, had already been assassinated, right, and all this stuff. You was found not guilty of this. What's the real story there, Marvin, with that? What actually happened there with that? You know, you know the narrow so what version. Is, what actually happened? It was a fit up, right? And I know, I don't listen. Listen to me. Everybody says, "Oh, yeah, everything's a fit up," but I'll tell you what happened. Um, do you remember Barry Hibbard and John Toomey got arrested for the Heathrow stuff? I do. Yeah, I, I, I was do. supposed to be arrested for them on that because they had my DNA on the motorbike and down the, in the crash helmet, and they actually come and arrested me after for other... Anyway, so... Because we were so prolific, right, in drugs, violence, and sort of robberies, right, and we couldn't... They couldn't convict us on lots of things, and we got away with lots of things. Like, I'm not trying to glorify that crime lifestyle, but... I got away with a hell of a lot of stuff to the point where the police had to do something. And I don't blame them for doing what they've done because I would have done the same thing if I was a policeman. I was getting away with everything, right? And I couldn't be convicted. And it was just one of them things. And I got arrested for a couple of shootings. I got arrested for a couple of robberies. I got arrested for under investigation for murders and loads of things. But as police officers being police officers, they're getting frustrated because he's got to be doing something. He's got, he's with this one, he's with that one, he's with this one, he's, he's got to be him, he's got to be him. So what they tried to do is fit me up with Barry and them, like put my DNA on the moat, right? But then prior to that, what happened? We got arrested for a machine gun and a silencer. Um, and basically what they said is we was a yardy hit team on a mission to kill so many people because we was having a war over territory so i think two or three people had been killed um five or six people had been shot um there was constant conflict like tit for tat shooters like cars got sprayed up houses got booted off people got shot people got kidnapped people got tortured you know and it was just going a bit chaotic so basically we got arrested because on the night, we used to look after a guy, I can't remember his, his, his whole name, Seamus something. He used to run a pub in Shepherd's Bush. Now, every 31st of July, he used to do the Irish racing over Kempton. So we was his bodyguards because he used to bring the money back to Shepherd's Bush. So we used to go over there firm-handed, wear a vest, do you know what I mean, he didn't know we was told up, but we'd have a couple of little bits and pieces on us, and we'd go and do what we're doing. Bring him home, drop him off, and go about our business. So this one night, like, we've dropped him off, we've got in the cab. Now, I used to live in Barney, so I've got to go to Kentish Town to get a bit of puff, because I used to smoke weed really strong back then. So I'm going to get a bit of weed before I go home. So I'm not armed. I'm not armed. My mates are not armed, right? So we're going to get a bit of puff before we go home. As we've turned up to get a bit of path, we're walking up a road, the road's just come alive with old our bill, right? Now, how I know it was a fitter, we had the regional crime squad, we had soccer, and we had the anti-terrorist group. An inspector from each unit on the spot within three minutes, Stephen. Right? Doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't like happen, that. mate, right? And there was uh, maybe 55 police officers within three minutes. And I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, cut a long story short. One of the police officers has gone to his community support officer. Listen, there's a gun around here somewhere. We've got to look for it. How could you assume there's a gun on a street when you just stop three people? So they've stopped us. They're searching for this gun for ages. Can't find it. Can't find it. Can't find it. And all of a sudden, we get put in the cars, go get taken down to the police station, and then hold up, they find a machine gun. A Mac-10 silencer armor piercing bullets, subsonic bullets, so you don't hear no supersonic boom. The silence of muffles the sound of a gun crack. And we're a hit team. 
So then we get arrested, we go away. While we're away, and they start saying that we're responsible for 87% of the gun crime in London. These guns are responsible for X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Right? So then we go to trial, we go to trial, and they said that the difference between this organisation, every other one, we're professionals. We are so forensically aware that they won't find anything on us, and our guns was in pristine condition. One of the, the gun that they found hadn't even been fired, right? But then when they've come to trial, they brought a gun in as exhibit, which was about 50 years old. So we're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. That ain't brand new. So I said to the defence, I said, hold on a minute. Have a look at the, um, the forensic report to the firearms. You say on page whatever that the firearm is immaculate and it hadn't even been fired. Now, I am no gun expert. But if you look at that gun, it looks about 50 years old. You can see where it's been cocked about thousands of times. I said, it doesn't look brand new. So the judges said, let's have a look. The judges had a look. And he said, the jury needs to see this. So he's giving it to the jury. Right? And on that basis, we got the not guilty. Because you could see that it was a fitter. Didn't match, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, look, I hear that. All I can say is per personal experience. When I went to the Bailey, we screamed fitter. They definitely moved items around and all that. And look, as you say, you know, in that live, you know, Marvin, so you're you getting away with a lot of stuff. They concoct stuff and they say, look, you know, as a target criminal, career criminal, we'll you take him off the street the anyway. Right? The I mean, that's how it works, yeah? Me personally, when, they, when we got Nick, I was getting 36 years recommended. That was it. So they've come in and said, right, Herbert, we'll give you a deal. I said, what deal? They said, we'll give one of your co-defendants no more than five years. I said, go fuck yourself. I said, for what? I know you're fitting me up, you know, good cunt. There's no way I'm pleading guilty to that. And then obviously, my co-defendant took a deal, yeah? And then we got found guilty by association and got five and a half years. And that's why I went to prison on my last sentence. Marvin, I see it. I really do. Now, look, I always say as well, right, that you can't know true light without knowing true true darkness. Or you can't know, you know, true darkness without having experienced light. So, you know, thank you for the stuff you've told us there about some of the real dark moments in your history. But when you've gone on, let's talk about what you've gone on to be and where you are now. What was the first moment or the first experience time with a person or project or whatever where you knew in your heart and soul, your psyche, every fiber of your being, you know what? I've got it now. This is me now. No matter what happened, there is no way I would go so back to that life. What was that? What was that time? Young Gotten. It was a young, young African kid called Gotten, which is a friend of my son's. And basically, I just said to him, look, Satan's made me come off the road. Satan's put me in this position. I said, now come to the gym every day with me, and I can guarantee you, because I used to know what I was going to get away with, and I used to know what I'm going to get called, and I used to know how long I'm going to get in sentence, but I accepted it all because of an occupational hazard. So what I've said to him after that transition with the, the penny dropping moment, I just said to him, look, we need to work. And no matter what we do, we're going to be successful because we're them types of people. I said, so come to the gym with me. And then this kid, he's come back to me, he said, ah, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I said, no, 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 listen, stay in the gym, stay in the gym. So the next thing he, he became, he got a job. And then he got a little bit deflated. I said, stick at it, come to the gym, come back to the gym, come back to the gym. And then he started growing a little bit more, got a bit better, got a bit better, got a bit better. Then he got into the music world. And then I plugged him into the music world. And then I plugged him into a couple of links. And then he's just gone. So what I've realized at that specific moment of my life is that I'm a facilitator. I was a facilitator in my past life. And I'm a facilitator in this life. So I used to get the job done for people. So if you had a problem, you could ring Marv. Marv would sort the problem out. Now, if it was stabbing, shootings, or whatever, I'd get involved if it was money involved, right? Anything to do with murder, I shied away from because I got told by a spirit, a, a, um, a spiritualist, that you can't kill people for money and expect to grow prosperous. Uh, what's it? Prosperity. Uh, yeah, you can't have prosperity if you take life for money. If someone tries to kill you 
and you defend yourself and they die, that's a different scenario. But if you take money and you try to kill people, then that's you're finished. Your soul's burned and you will never grow. Once you took that soul, you'll never grow. So anything but murder, I got involved with to the hill, right? And I was in it. I was doing it. I was being it. I was everything to do with it. So that energy that I had in that last world, in this new world, I thought, Joe, you know what? I'm a facilitator. So what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to find everybody the right avenues for them to go because I've got a network that's insurmountable. I've got a network that reaches the, the whole planet. And that's the whole, like, I can't say the whole planet because I don't know anybody in Korea or Japan, but Australia, Singapore, China, Holland, Belgium, France, Russia, Georgia, Sardinia, Croatia, Poland, Yugoslavia, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Holland, them everywhere. I know someone in every one of them places, like friends, family. I can go there and stay family, friends, houses. Do you understand? So what I started doing is reigniting with all the people I know, even straight people that have worked their whole life. That I've, I used to go and see and visit, but I've never done anything with them because they were straight. So they'll start saying, well, I'm straight now. I'm not going to do it. It's say, oh, Marv, excellent. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You can do this and you can do that. And I'm thinking, wow, this is easy. So then I'll just basically, I just lead the horses to the legitimate water and let them eat and grow. And that's all I do, really, Steve. No, look, look, I get it. You know, and I know other people around there will want to want to know this question. I mean, you know, and I mean, I'm new, Richie McGovern. I'm, you see, this... This underworld that we that we come from, it's very it's very closeted into tight knit groups, and you know, I mean, I would know people all over London the same as you. We didn't actually know each other until we come together that time, yeah, and then we and, because, because we're living on different we're, we're living on different frequencies. Yeah, absolutely. But I look, guess. but look, but look, when we look, you know, I mean, it's just like the organised crime, you know. But when we met that time, you know, I mean, you know, my code. You know, you knew Gary, right? You know, Gary, yeah. someone very, very close to us. And look, a lot of the people who would have been moving around our around our orbits very close to us would have been very linked in different ways. This is just the way We're all organized linked. crime is, right? But, but the thing is, I used to look at all them people and think, I'm never going to be like them. I'm going up. I'm not going to be like them. Do you understand? So I used everybody as a stepping stone for me to get out of all that bullshit. I've never done it because I wanted to be in it. I wanted out oh, Absolutely. Of it. I wanted out absolutely. of it. Do you understand? Because yeah. from an early age, I had it with a lot of rich kids. That mm. like, My mate's dad designed him in his own nightclub. Mm. Do you understand? Like They lived in million pound houses. Like, back in the day, million pound houses. I thought, this is, what I, this is what I want. I want a driver. I want housemaids. I want clean. I want that. I don't want to do this shit like my mum. I don't want that. So I was just aspired to that sort of aristocracy lifestyle rather than the criminal lifestyle. So I was always driven to aristocracy, not the villains. To me, if I'm being honest, Steve, all them top villains, I never really respected none of them. And that's why I had so much conflict. Because I've been there coming, I think, you know what, after a little bit, I think, well, you ain't really got no money though. What have you got? You live in a piss hole. You're driving a shitty. Like, who are you? What, you nick money every now and then? I don't want that. So I always looked at all the villains as a, like a springboard. I never, I never wanted to be like this guy. No, I don't want my kids growing up like that. What well, you think is good giving your kids that? You think it's my, none of my kids are criminals. I've got five kids, not one of them's a criminal. Do you know what I mean, they don't even smoke weed, my kids. Marv, I mean. Marv, look, absolutely. You know, again, I have to agree with you. It was exactly the same for me. And I always, knew there was more. I was always around people like that who had money from a very early age. So I knew there was much more than what we would seem to be trapped in. And I was just like you, you know, and I, you know, I've gone on, you know, I've gone on to achieve well done, so much, right? That's through hard work and being right and learning and being real and being humble and, you know, being part of the human race, not a part of, being part of the human race. And giving where I used to take so much in that life. That's just me, right? You know, I, I've had to Here's work in it. The same as you. Here's a question for you. 
Do you think that would have happened without the 12 steps? Um, it's hard to say, but the 12 steps for me was fundamental in my journey. So it was, uh, you know, one of my things was I had criminality, I had serious trauma, I had real anti-social issues, anti-authority issues, very violent, uh, you know, addiction issues. You know, I went on to have mental, mental health issues. I mean, the whole nine yards. So I really had to um, circumvent all of that. You know, I had to come back from what even one of them, many people don't come back from. Marv, you know that. But you're a miracle. I mean, you are. It's very fair to say the same as me, just for the adversity that we've overcome because people don't come back from that, right? And then the extra bit, which is what I, this show's all about and why it's fascinating, these journeys, no matter what side people may think that we are or what industry we're in, is what we go on to do. What are the lessons? The exceptional bit where we go on to create. This is where there is unbelievable value, you know right? My biggest, my biggest, my, the biggest sort of, achievement ever right was getting personally invited to dan street i see that well Mate, done that's quite a I thing right say, i couldn't i thought it was a wide up i thought it was a wide up i'm telling you i thought it was a wide up but then they said to me i oh, want you to come to the house of lords to do this this and that i was like are you winding me up i was like no marv listen 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 i was like oh fuck off dickhead they're not gonna have me in dan street they said no you've got the clearance already and I went down there, I'm standing in the queue behind all the celebrities and all the people that are going to get, saying say they're getting given off the, um, the Prime Minister. I'm standing in the queue behind one of the young artists that we know, growing up, Big Nasty, who's got his own TV show now. So I'm standing with him having a laugh and a giggle. And then the majors come out and said, what are you doing queuing up? I said, I'm just queuing. They said, no, 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 no. You're different. You come straight round. And they just fast track me round and walk straight in. Just walked straight into Downing Street and then I walked up to Theresa May. Theresa May was from like, not even 12 foot away, six, eight foot away, right there. And then I had the, 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 the MOD, like the, 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 the head of the, all these charities, like these big people in front of me said, oh, your story's amazing. You're an amazing guy. And I've heard so much. And I was like, wow, wow. Do you know what I mean? It was like, bam. You know, like, and it's just, from that point, yeah, I knew that I'm on this planet and everything I've been through in my whole entire life was to actually do what I'm doing. And when I've said to the major, I said to him, oh, thanks for the invite. He said, I never invited you. Number 10 invited you. So afterwards, I said to him, I ain't being funny. Why did they invite me down here? And he said, well, basically what it was, he'd done a course, he'd been doing some bits and pieces with Dr. Mark Prince, right? Because this is how it happened. Dr. Mark Prince has said to me, rang me up one day, because he's a good friend of mine. He's rung me up one day and said, oh, Marv, I've got a couple of kids in Tottenham I'm doing a, um, a workshop with. Would you mind coming down and having a talk with them? So I said, yeah, not a problem, Mark. Not a problem, anything for you, mate. Because obviously his son got killed and murdered, yeah? And he's gone on to do exceptional, amazing things, right? So anything I could do to help him, I'd do. Because prior to my meeting with him, I was very sceptical to reach out to him because of his son got murdered and I was always associated with murders and killings and stabbings and beatings. So I just thought, I wouldn't have it with someone like that if they killed my son. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't, well, I don't even know how I'd even behave. So I'd never reached out to him. And then he reached out to me when we'd done, um, we'd done a, a program, a workshop at the, the Central Criminal Court. Someone asked me to go over. And while I'm in there, Mark's come up and started speaking to me. I said, I'm so glad you spoke to me because I was too scared to speak to you. Anyway, so I've got up to, uh, to his workshop in Tottenham. And I've walked in and I've gone, boom, right, youngsters, come here, come here. And they've all come over. I said, right, brrrr, an hour and 20 minutes, right? Now they're all sitting there talking, just not even talking, just listening. And they said, right, this is what I wanted to do. Crash, bang, wallop. They've all hop, skip and jump. I said, right, come here. Another half an hour conversation. Right, scratch, win, wallop, crash, bang, wallop. And they've all done it. So the person from Downing Street that was there with Mark, what he said like, was that he's been working with these kids for a certain amount of time. And he said, what I see you do was amazing. Like these kids, I've seen them work and do this. 
and they've never sat still for longer than 10 minutes. And Mark finds it challenging with them, right? And I'm telling you, it was just, you know, that was a penny dropping moment. So then I went from there to um, Art Burnett and Danes, which is a school over in West London. And I had the hardest to reach kids from there. I went in there and then I've done a knife campaign in Liverpool, in Iton, with 25 of the worst kids from the Prue, like the people referral units. And I had 25 kids, all from warring postcodes in Iton, sitting down, yeah, for six weeks without one fight, yeah? And by the end of the course, every one of the kids had basically turned their mindsets in the opposite direction, you know? So I realised I had a gift because I'm not talking shit to these kids. I'm telling them, listen, don't think you're not getting used. Don't think you're not being abused. Right. Why, why, if you love someone, are you going to give them a product, right, that's going to get them killed? Why are you going to give them a product that can get them put in prison for five years, 10 years, 25 years? Why are you going to do that if you love them? They're grooming you so they don't have to go to prison. Don't be groomed. Don't be groomed. And that was my purpose for my journey, to let all these kids know that they're groomers. I used to be a groomer. My own cousin, I groomed my cousins to sell food for me. Do you understand? And I used to not serve him up, but give him a couple of slaps. Where's my money, you little prick? Slap him up. But come on, that's all it is, it's just grooming. So I've gone man to England, letting them know that don't be groomed by people like me because they don't love you. And if they love you, this is the question you ask them. Here's your product, son. I love you. Da -da -da -da. If I get stopped by the police, can I tell them you give it to me? That's how you find out if they love you, son. And you'll see the difference. And they'll tell you, keep your fucking mouth shut because snitches get stitches. How can you say that to someone you love? Now, I've got a recording studio. So I've said to the kids one day, right, here's some equipment, right? It's worth £250,000, right? If you get stopped by the police, tell them to ring me because I'll give it to you, right? Simple. I've said to another kid, here's my car. Take my car. But in the boot, there's £30,000 worth of CDs. If the police stop you, let them know that I'll give you the car and give them my number. Right? If you've got to go to prison, or your life's in danger for a product that one of your olders is giving you, then you're being groomed. End of. So that's the message I'm putting out there, Stephen Gillen. And that's what look, I'm so hell-bent on doing. Look, look, that's spot on and that's great. You know, thank you for that. And look, you know, I'm going to come in because my my experience as well, I'm going to name someone else, you know, and you know him. He's a, a very good friend of mine. I grew up with him, Jack Ramadan. Now, Jack, he's very similar to the work that you've done. He's done unbelievable work. In, in East London, you know, he had a boxing gym, you know, he was doing the music thing there. You know, he's doing wonderful work still, just like you. But what I see with Jack, you know, I grew up with Jack, and what I see with you, and this is a difference, and it has to be said, is when we're going right into these really tough inner city, grassroots neighbourhood with the kids, it's not an easy thing. The first thing, like you've just said, is they respect authority of someone who has lived a life from the top to the bottom, and wrote the fucking book, right? Stop this is the listening. only thing they're listening to. They're not listening to some corporate guy who thinks he knows something out of a book. Yeah. And you know what? It's a tough thing. But look, you know, we're all in this to really, really help. And look, I have to, uh, you know, I've been there. I, I do what I can. I do a lot of work. My work's out there too. But I know just how hard it is in the inner cities with the kids that matter, with the challenging behaviours, traumas and histories that they have behind them to put that specialist, specialist gift of knowledge, of experience into them and liven them up a bit in the right ways you know to I'm arm them for the future, right? The problem is that they're not being, their peer groups are not giving them the right information. So that's what I do. Because I've got the network, I've got the network, I've got the platform and I've got the training and the exit for anything to do with football, boxing and music, roofing, scaffolding and household maintenance. I've got it now, right now. That is what I do. So we've got all the avenues for these kids to be trained and, and employed. Mm. 
Why can I guarantee that? Because they're getting trained and employed and then by my companies. Simple. It's not complicated. We've got boxing, we've got football, we've got MMA, we've got music, roofing and scaffolding. Now, if that ain't enough, what is? You know, so it's about the people that are going to speak to these kids and the opportunity. You can't just go and speak to these kids and expect them to change. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll get kids in the gym. I'll get them training. I'll get them eating. But I'll reward them. So I've had eight kids from West London. So I said, right, who's your favourite boxer? So I've got a list of all the boxers. I said, right, if you not get in the gym and you do this, this, this and that, I'll get the boxer to come and meet you. Who's your favourite man on the radio? Charlie Sloth. I said, right, if you do X, Y, Z, I'll get Charlie to come and speak to you. So I've got young kids that go have been on tour in Europe with Charlie Sloth. They're not even signed. Do you know what I mean? I've got boxers that have come and met, like kids who have come and met world champions that are not even boxers. Do you understand? So footballers, I've got my own football academy. So anything to do with football, do you know what I mean? We just plug them into Harry Redknapp. Harry, can you do me a favour, please, Harry? I've got a couple of kids. Can we? Yeah, not a problem, Marvin. Bam. Because I met Harry through... Um, Dr. Mark Prince. And I have a personal relationship with um, Harry Red. I can ring him up now and we'll have a conversation. I've had him on my podcast, so I've got the data recording. I went down his house. I went down his house, Harry Redknapp, come on. So we're plugged in and we can help. So this is what I do and this is what I will continue to do till the day I die. But my purpose is not just to create employment, it's to create a platform so we can change the mindset of the working class individuals to become businessmen, to create a growth in business and to grow in business. And that is my message and that is my ethos and that is my aims, goals and objectives. Look, that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful, you know, and well done, you know, for this wonderful, uh, wonderful work you're doing, you know, and the wonderful work you are continuing to do. We're very, you know, we're there to support you as well. You know, we've talked, there's a lot of stuff we're going to be doing, you know, in the future. Look, we talked, uh, we talked the other day on the phone, Marv, right? And you also mentioned about you just left court where you were trying to help someone there. What was happening there? Tell tell the audience of of, of well, what a, you're trying to do kid, there as well. I've well been caught up with a, um, an issue. Basically, it was in the paper, so I can talk about it. Basically, a young guy has, um, was with a girl the girl left him for someone else. Um, he's gone and tried to kidnap the kid and take him away and hurt him or whatever. I don't know what the particulars are in the case. But the young kid that we were working with was, was expecting an 8 to 12. So we've gone in there with um, other organisations. I can't say, I, I, I might not be at liberty to mention their organisations right now because it, I don't know what involvement that they had in the transition. But I know me and Dr. Mark Prince had a part to play in it, and there's one other organisation. So basically, when we've gone to the court, we've given the, um, the defence that are mitigating circumstances, avenues, targets, goals, and then we got him three years, nine months. So to us, it was a result. All right, he deserved the custodial sentence, and but he got the minimum custodial sentence he's got, he could get considering that it was starting from an eight to a 12. Do you know what I mean? And then it got reduced to three years, nine months. So to us, it was a win, 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 win. And I've got another court case next month, which I'll, I'll give you the information on that, but that'll be phenomenal because that was a, he's a little bit higher up the, the pecking order in the criminal fraternity, this young man. Um, and he's got a pocker. He, like, so you know what a pocker is, don't you? So you know what levels he was at. You know, so this kid's got a pocket. He's at a certain level. So I'll come back and let you know the results of that case in due course. But this is what I'm doing. I'm not trying to get people out of crime. So what I've said to everyone I work with is this, right? I will help you. I will engage with you. And I will do everything I can to keep you on a consistent journey of success. But I will, without a shadow of a doubt, if you're on license or if you're on home leave or you're still in prison, yeah, or you're out of prison on license. I will pick up the phone and get you put back in prison if you breach my agreement. Okay? I'm not carrying no one just to get them out of prison. The only reason I'm getting you out of prison is if you are 100% faithful, 100% committed to not being a criminal. And if you cannot be that, I will personally pick up the phone and get you banged back up. 
look, you know, for people out there, our journeys, like a mirror, me being you, you being me, you know, to make it really simple, you're a bit of 10 down the street, you know, you're changing lives now, you're doing a lot of, you know, a lot of real inspirational stuff that's making a difference. I mean, look, you know, I'll just say it because it's relevant just to show people out there. A lot of my work's out there. But even this morning, you know, even this morning, I was on a talking politics show on Sky to over a billion people worldwide, even more than that. That's the seventh of the world. I do a lot of this stuff. Yeah, you know, I mean, I do a lot of this stuff and this stuff. But just to say what is possible, you know, and I truly believe, you know, Marv, and I know a little bit does and can change its spots and you can be anything you want to be. There's a middle bit where you need to change and do what you need to do to get there. But you can change and you can be anything that you want to be. So, look, you know, well done for your wonderful work. So, in the future, what is next for Marvin Herbert? Well, to be quite honest with you, I don't know. But what I do aim to do is make sure that I can change the mindsets of everybody that come from the same place I did, the same environment, with the same grooming network, with the same peer groups, change their mindsets into becoming proper human beings, not just a product of benefit to their peers or their environment. And I'll do anything I can through training, education and employment to achieve that goal. And I don't really know any other way to put it. Like, I, I, I mentor the kids into not becoming the versions of Marvin Herbert that I've become because I did reach the top of the criminal ladder and it is no value. And my new slogan is, I reached the top of the criminal ladder. I reached the top of the criminal ladder. I reached the top of the criminal ladder. For what? And that was it, you know? And it's just, it's, it, it, for what? I don't get it now. So I try to teach the kids that you're going to get to the top of the ladder, you're going to earn millions, but you're going to have to go to prison, you would have had to been shot, you would have had to shoot people, you would have had to suffer, your people, your families, your mum, your dad, your nans, your kids, everybody has to suffer for you to get there. For what? To continue the rest of your life inflicting the same damage, trauma and pain. For what? So what I'm aiming to get now is a change of the narrative and a change of direction for the thousands and if not millions of youngsters that want to follow in my footsteps. Now. Marvin, that's a fantastic message. You are a, you are a miracle. Your journey is exceptional. I know you're going to go on to do wonderful things. That's why, you know, I've had you on here. You know, we're certainly there to help you in any way that we can. Thanks for coming on, Marvin. Really, thank you. I'll be back once I've been to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> when I've been my OBE, son. I'll be back. Yeah. Listen, thank you, man. It. So see it, believe it, and achieve it. See it, believe it, and achieve it. Okay? That's what the message to these youngsters now. And I'm going to Buckingham Palace. I'm going to get OBE'd, MBE'd, and knighted. By the time I'm 60, I will be a sir. And that's what I can guarantee, because that's what I believe. And that's where I'm heading. Okay? Aristocracy is coming my way. My two younger children are going to boarding school. They speak exceptionally well and they're middle class. So we're changing the narrative within me and my environment and my life and my bloodline. And I hope and pray that I could do that with thousands and then millions of other individuals. Marvin, that is a, a wonderful message. The crazy thing about my transition is that I wouldn't be the man I am today if it wasn't for a guy called Daniel Kinahan. Now, I know Daniel gets a hell of a lot of bad press in the papers, but he's the man that really opened my eyes up to the grooming and the usage of the criminal underworld that had for me. So he always encouraged me to be the man I've become today. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, you get used. You've been groomed. This happened and that happened. And look, they're not your friends. But here's the one who gives me that why would you give someone a product that can get them put in prison if you love them? Why would you give someone a product that can get them killed if you love them? Do you understand? Like, these people that you do all your bits and pieces for, they're only getting you to do all the bits and pieces because you're their benefit. 
And it was that that made the penny drop for me. And it's ironic that he gets so much bad press when everybody that I know that has been in contact with this man has gone on to achieve great things in the legitimate world. Like, and he never, ever in the, I'd say, 15 years I've known him, has ever done anything to encourage me to commit crime, you know? And the fact that he gets so much bad press is really sort of fascinating to me, considering he's never been convicted. Do you know what I mean? And he's been to prison on remand and stuff, but he's never been convicted. And, and Nicola Tallon, the news reporter, crime news reporter for Ireland, done a centre spread. She said that um, I couldn't be... I wouldn't have ever been straight if it wasn't for Daniel Kinnan. And she put in a paper that gangster turns advocate. Do you understand? So everyone's recognising I've turned my life around, but you've got to look at the influences that made me do that. Like, like I said to you earlier, I wouldn't have listened to anyone that wasn't me growing up because I thought everyone was an idiot. And Daniel has really pushed me to become the man I am today. So I actually owe a lot of my transitional success down and listening to the advice and information and guidance that I got from Daniel, you know, and it's quite surprising that he gets so much bad press still considering he's never had a conviction. And it's, and no, that's, that's wonderful. I look, you know, I mean, I've been in that paper as well on a double thing and you know, that paper there, they, they're very, they don't print stuff like that unless they're really sure about the content of the story. I well, know that you know, because I've been in that paper. So with that kind of spin on a crime story, and so I know that they really look into it and it, it, they they ascertain all the facts of the people that they write these two page spreads about. And certainly my experience. So look, Marvin, um, you've been a wonderful guest. Um, your story is amazing. I know you're certainly going to go on to do wonderful things, um, you know, I'm watching watching the journey. I'm excited for you because I love creation. I love I I love these stories. I've traveled my own, and I know making things better. I can't see anything better in a life journey than to do that. And uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, guys. The wonderful Marvin Herbert. Make uh, make sure to subscribe, like, press the bell as well. You know the notification because you'll always know. You know when something fresh comes up. We have wonderful guests uh, like Marvin on exceptional journeys and we look to go deep and find the value for you to help you expedite your own personal journey of success.